In the early 80s, I was hired to handle the press for the reissue of Pandora's Box, a 1929 German silent film directed by G.W. Pabst and starring the great Louise Brooks. The person who hired me was Don Krim. He had a company called Kino International, and he did a lot of reissues. And while this film was considered a classic, it had actually never been brought out in a big screen in New York City for a premiere since it came out for the first time. While the film had been celebrated for a long time by film scholars and film lovers in general, it came to a whole level of public awareness when an article appeared in The New Yorker in 1979, written by Kenneth Tynan and called The Girl in the Black Helmet. Tynan gets into a lot of things in this amazing article, which I highly recommend you read, but one of the most important is why did Louise Brooks get cast in this movie to begin with? I mean, after all, she was a young woman from Kansas who didn't speak any German, and Pabst had never even met her when he offered her the role. Maybe Pabst just cast Louise Brooks because of her looks. After all, she was playing Lulu, a character who had to lead four men to their doom. So he felt like the way she looked, it might work. But Tynan had a more elaborate theory. He felt that Pabst saw a scene in a film that Louise Brooks did called A Girl in Every Port that was directed by Howard Hawks. And in that scene, she's on a couch with two best friends, played by Victor McLaughlin, who's in love with her, and Robert Armstrong. So she asks Victor McLaughlin to clean her shoe. And while he's down there happily doing that, she puts her hand on Robert Armstrong's thigh and just kind of caresses it very innocently. And Tynan felt that was what Pabst must have been looking for. Someone who wasn't some obvious person, evil, leading men astray, but somebody who just was made a certain way and that caused bad things to happen. Tynan's interview revealed uh, Louise Brooks, who was hilarious and refreshingly honest and could talk about all these kind of horrible things that happened to women in Hollywood in those days. I, I highly recommend the book that she wrote about her life called Lulu in Hollywood. Because Brooks was an actress who became a really good writer, I thought it would be interesting to arrange an interview with another actress who became a good writer, and that's Chris Chase, who had a column in the New York Times called At the Movies. Chris had started her acting career playing the lead role in Stanley Kubrick's Killer's Kiss under the name Irene Kane. While she continued to act in movies and TV and theater, she mainly worked as a writer, writing her own biography as well as co-authoring some biographies with celebrities. She was very, very funny and had this very no-nonsense attitude towards the film business, so I thought it would be a good mix. While I was working on the film, I always tried to keep Louise informed with everything that was going on. So I would send her clippings and reviews, and when she would get them, she would often send me a letter back with a piece of paper. It was all torn, and she would just go, thank you for Vincent Canby, or something like that. And I kept all these little scraps of paper because I thought it was so cool to have this correspondence from her. One day, I was walking around downtown, and I saw this woman who seemed to be dressed up exactly like her. She had the Louise Brooks Jazz A's bob. It just looked exactly like her. And she had the clothes, she had put on vintage clothing and everything. So I went up to the woman, I said, can I take your picture? And she wondered why, and I explained. And she was very flattered. And I took the picture and I sent it to Louise. A few days later, I get a letter and it says, send more. Love, Louise. From that point on, I was on a mission. I was patrolling the streets of New York City, looking everywhere for the ultimate 1920s jazz age Louise Brooks Bob. 
And my friends would go, look at that person. Isn't that a good one? And I would say, no, that page boy, are you kidding? Because a lot of haircuts look a little bit like this, but if you're trying to look like Louise Brooks, you've really got to be doing it consciously. You've got to start with a photograph. It's got to be sharp. It's got to be close to the side of the face, and it's got to be glued on with crazy glue. You've got to have the right kind of hair. You've got to have somebody who can cut it for you. And you have to have the style and the attitude that can pull it off. And not many people can, but I found some. Because in those days, a lot of people were dressing up in costumes every night, costumes of their own invention. If you went to the clubs, you'd see people dressed all kinds of ways in a different way every night. And every now and then, I'd see her. And I'd take the picture and I'd fire it off to Rochester. And I know that she was really, really pleased because she told me so in these little notes. As the job was drawing down, I decided I wanted to get an autograph. It's not something I commonly do when I'm working with people, but I'd never met her, so I kind of was a fan as well as a publicist. So I sent her this thing, and she sent me back this autograph, and it's something that I truly treasure to this day. I saved all the little scraps of paper that Louise had sent me in a special place, and every now and then I would go there and I'd take them out, and I'd just really savor having them. It just made me so happy to know that I'd had any connection at all to this extraordinary woman. Then one day, I was looking for them and I, I couldn't find them anywhere. Shortly after that, Louise Brooks died in Rochester. She was 78 years old. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like me to keep making more of them, please pass it on to somebody you think might like it. Thank you.